The following is a presentation that was given to the EPA on July 30th, 2020 on the use of biocides in the paper industry. And we are doing this recording on September 3rd, 2020. Um, this presentation was pulled together by the Center for Biocide Chemistries. And this is the legal disclaimer. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ken Keaton, the principal speaker, and he's going to run through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, as Emily mentioned, my name is uh, Ken Keegan. I recently retired from Camura Chemicals, where uh, my last position was a senior product line manager for microbiological and deposit control. A little background on myself. I have uh, 37 years experience in uh, paper chemicals, particularly spe specialty paper chemicals and deposit control, microbiome control. I started my career in R&D and then moved into marketing for the, the past 20 something years or so. Uh, I'm past chairman of TAPI's Microbiological Control Committee and have a really extensive list of publications and presentations on uh, microbiome and deposit control. <clears throat> so today's presentation is to get you uh, more familiar with the paper making process in general. Uh, chemicals and additives that are used in, in paper and really work towards the use of biocides, why they are used uh, and then how they are applied and also a little bit on uh, final uh, potential exposures and the environmental fates. I will also um, kind of reiterate that I am not, I don't have a regulatory background. I have worked over my career with a number of great uh, regulatory professionals uh, so I know something about that, but uh, I'm certainly not my area of expertise. My area is more in paper making and in microbiome and deposit control in in paper making. So with with that, uh, we'll get started. Uh, first, the contributors the at the uh, CBC uh, four companies: uh, Camira Chemicals, Nalco Water, which is a division of Ecolab. Uh, Buckman and Lanxis Corporation all contributed to this presentation. Uh, just to get us grounded on how big or what the paper industry is in the U.S. Uh, so uh, this is data as of April 20th obtained from uh, a couple of different uh, sources. You can see them on the bottom uh, received. Uh, and Fisher are both uh, commercial databases on the paper industry. And I also included a comparison to uh, data from 2010, 10 years ago. So overall paper industry is a fairly large industry in the US, $40 billion in turnover. Uh, there are 433 mills in North America, but uh, 400 or 350 or so of those are in the uh, US. Uh, this is down from 10 years ago. Uh, same thing with the number of paper machines. Each mill can have more than one paper machine. That's why there are roughly twice as many uh, paper machines as there are. This again is down. And the uh, concentration of the industry has increased. Uh, there are uh, only 134 corporations owning all these paper uh, mills. So it's kind of reflective of what I think everybody kind of knows already that the paper industry is, has been in decline. Papers, magazines uh, are really way down from where they were 10 years ago. Uh, so it's all the printing and writing grades have uh, decreased dramatically uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, North America supplies about 17% of the world's paper and this is down. All Part of that is a reflection of the industry itself decreasing, but also a, sh a general world shift that in particularly the Asian market has been growing where the uh, rest of the world's markets have been shrinking. Um, I'm gonna talk more in the, later in the presentation about production rates for paper machines, but uh, again, a paper machine is a large uh, uh, operation uh, and it produces somewhere between depending on the grade 10 and 100 tons of paper per hour uh, also paper is paper making is a 24 7 operation uh, it's intensive these machines are large and expensive and you'll see pictures later 
so that downtime taking a paper machine down is very costly on the largest machines that can cost up to a hundred thousand dollars an hour so uh, anything that impacts a paper papers uh, uh, production efficiency is is quite dramatic uh, a quick little map pulled from uh, the Fisher database of where paper mills are located in, in North America. So as a, a general rule, paper makers, paper uh, mills are located near the trees, uh, with the exception of recycle mills, which are tend to be located in cities or, or towns. So this is just kind of the ground you to let you know where it is. And you can see the, you know, in the middle of the country, the Great Plains, not many trees, not many paper mills, kind of goes hand in hand. So that was the, the quick overview of the, the paper industry. I get into how does one make paper? Uh, so paper is not a thing, it's a lot of different things. There are a lot of different grades of paper. And again, you're probably all aware of that. Uh, what this chart will help with is some of the terms you'll, you may run into in applications in terms of paper. Uh, liner board is the outside of uh, brown boxes uh, that you typically get, you know, your TV in or your pizzas. Corrugating is that uh, a fluted medium in between the liner board that gives the strength of the corrugated box. I think bag, tissue towel is self-explanatory. Uh, printing and writing grades would be your Xerox, uh, notepads, things like that. Newsprint for newspaper. Bleach board is the... Uh, 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 the type of paper that or board that would be like a your cosmetics come in the, the finer grade white often printed uh, heavier board uh, and then magazine stock recycle is uh, a very general term recycle papers because it can be in almost any of the grades above there can be a recycle content or it can be made from 100 percent recycled papers and just as an aside, North America, uh, excuse me, the U.S. currently has a recycling rate for paper, I believe, is right around 65 percent. So 65 percent of all paper produced is recycled in the U.S. Um, some pictures, and again, I'd like to point out that there is uh, no standard paper machine. Every paper machine is unique. They are designed to produce a specific grade or a range of weights within a grade of, of paper. Uh, so picture on the bottom right corner would show corrugating medium. Uh, the machine that makes that could not make the tissue or towel shown above it or, or the newsprint. So machines are, are grade specific in what they are designed to, to make. This also makes it sometimes very difficult to make generalizations about um, a paper machine. And we'll get more into the details here in just a minute. Um, prior to the, the presentation, there were some questions about production rates, how much production uh, in tons per day. And it really, it, again, dependent and kind of as a rule of thumb, um, the heavier the sheet weight, whether you're making a, you know, a really lightweight sheet of tissue you know, all the way up to uh, a heavy board, the heavier weight, the higher the production rate. And it kind of makes, makes sense. So uh, this chart you can just use as reference to give you an idea of the typical production rate of, uh, of, of paper machines. Uh, So here we get a, a, a nice diagram of an integrated paper mill. And when I say integrated, that means it also has a pulp mill uh, along with a paper mill. Because what we're going to dive into are this, what paper makers consider the separate um, unit operations or sub subunits within paper making. So the, the first thing to note is all of this. You know, if you recall back to the, the very introduction, uh, there are only 800 paper machines, you know, 400 something paper mills in the U.S. making all the paper. So the implication is they are large. And if you look at this, we start over on the left at the river with water coming in, wood and wood chips going to our our pulping section. 
uh, from the, the pulpers, it moves to a washing section. The liquids used in pulping are recycled through a separate recycle unit and a boiler. But back to the, the paper, the fiber is washed. Then it moves on to the paper making operation with, again, distinct operations of what we would call stock prep, sheet forming, press section, and dryers. And then uh, separate unit operation for coating. Um, the water is generally treated in, in effluent plants uh, before discharge. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. But again, it's hard to appreciate the scale. This is, is certainly not drawn to scale, but the water influent can literally be a mile from the paper making operation. And the pulping operation could be a half mile from the paper making operation. So the paper mill sites are very large uh, and they each produce a lot of tonnage. Now let's, let's go into more detail. I already went over this uh, real quickly. So, Again, we start on the left. We have freshwater treatment. Uh, the vast majority of mills are using either surface water or well water. Uh, this water needs to be uh, treated uh, uh, to remove suspended solids and also treated uh, for microbial control. Uh, there's wood comes into the wood yard. It is chipped. Uh, the pulping process requires the, the logs. Uh, first step is to remove the bark. The logs are then chipped, sent on to the pulp mill digesters. In the digester, our goal is to separate the cellulose fiber from the other components in a tree. And I'm sure you, you, you're aware of trees that they have a lot of resinous components, uh, mainly lignin, but other organic materials that bind the cellulose together, which gives the, the tree its strength. Uh, the objective in pulp separate the cellulose fibers from these other organic materials uh, that are in, in the wood. So the most common pulping process, and I'll mention this again later, is called the Kraft process. Uh, Kraft is the German word uh, for strong, is where that comes from. And one of the, the advantages of the Kraft process is the ability to recycle the, the chemicals used in the pulping process. So. They go to uh, evaporators to concentrate them. They are then burned in what's known as a recovery boiler. Um, got ahead of myself. Uh, and recycled to, to the process. But let's stay with the fiber now. So we've separated the, the fiber from the organic content. That now needs to be washed. So we go to a washing stage. These are generally what are known as countercurrent washers, where you start with clean water at one end and, and use that in succession on each washer. So the pulp becomes successively cleaner. Then depending on the grade you're making, uh, there may be a bleach plant. That coming out of pulping, the pulp is light brown. Uh, again, you'd be familiar with this from a typical uh, cardboard box you get from Amazon. But many grades require paper to be white, uh, basically for printability. So a separate operation of bleaching, uh, using oxidizing chemicals to bleach the fibers from brown to white with, again, more washing stages, and then storage. And we've actually created our pulp. We have it stored. We move on to the paper making operation. So the first is, quote, stock prep, where this a uh, slurry of fibers is uh, diluted. It goes through screens and cleaners to remove any remaining contaminants. Uh, it can be with what are known as refiners to improve the strength and onto the paper making operation. So a paper machine. A paper machine, again, has several different units inside. It starts by forming the sheet on a moving wire. So you, this is just a, uh, you can kind of think a, a screen like your screen porch would have. Of course, it's it's much stronger than that, where the head box puts out a, a uniform jet of water onto the screen. The water drains, uh, and the sheet is formed. The sheet coming off the uh, the forming section uh, 
is around 10% solids. It then goes to a press section where it is pressed between a roll and a felt to remove more water. Coming out of the press section at 30 to 50% solids, it then goes to dryer section. Uh, the dryers are uh, 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 steam fed uh, cans. The sheet is pressed against them to evaporate the, the remaining water. Uh, in some mills, for some grades, there will be coders. Uh, coating is added to improve the optical and printing properties of the paper. Uh, they can either be online, in which case they'd be in line with the paper machine, or they can be offline as a separate operation. And then the last thing is the converting, where the paper machine is making these large parent rolls, what are known as parent rolls of paper. Uh, they can be up to uh, 30 feet wide. The converted is the term, uh, sit down to use. If it's going to a printer, they may be taking it as a roll. If it's a copy paper, it has to be cut to sheet size and packaged. And you can envision the same for tissue and, and other grades. So that's the big overview of paper making in a nutshell. Look at it now from just a, more of a block diagram instead of, a, of the, uh, the pictures. So we need to start with logs, logs to chips, chips to digester, digester to separate the cellulose fiber from the other um, materials present, in washer, to wash those other materials out and give us a slurry of cellulose fibers. If required, then onto bleaching, more washing. This then moves over to the paper mill. So we have pulp from the pulp mill. We also can have market pulp. Uh, some mills uh, uh, will purchase pulp from other mills because uh, different pulps have different properties. Softwood, hardwood, softwood would be a pine tree, hardwood would be Trees, trees with leaves, the, the softwood pulps tend to have longer fibers, they're stronger, but it's also coarser, doesn't print as well. So mills will make mixtures of different pulps depending on what grade of paper. And then also they can be getting recycled pulp where uh, uh, recycled waste paper is brought into the mill. It is uh, repulped, and we'll talk about this a little later too, in uh, what in essence is a large wearing blender. Uh, this all then goes to the stock prep, the paper machine, the coder, and finally shipping and conversion. Another term I'll introduce here is broke. Uh, fiber in the paper mill, paper making operation is quite expensive compared to everything else. So they try to recover any uh, uh, fiber that isn't ending up in the final sheet. Now this can be, there are are trims to trim the, the rolls down to the proper size. It can be when the machine, one part of the machine is taking some downtime, the rest of the machine is still running. That all goes to quote broke and is recycled back in the stock prep. So the fiber is reused uh, or the amount of fiber that's, that's lost or sent to, to affluent is always severely minimized in the paper making process. A different way to look at it too, the get inputs and outputs. So in the inputs for making paper, you have fiber, water, chemicals, and energy. And there really only are three outputs, and that is the final product, which can be any one of the grades shown on the right, steam coming out of the, uh, the dryer section, or effluent. So this hopefully kind of simplifies in your mind, there's only three places, anything that goes into the paper making process, there's only three places it can come out. It can come out as steam, the final product, or the effluent. Talk about each of the unit operations in a little more detail and make a few comments on the use of biocides in each. So pulping. Uh, there are different types of pulping, uh, chemical pulping, mechanical bleaching, recycled fiber. So uh, chemical pulping is the most common. This is done with highly caustic materials. Uh, and I mentioned before the craft process is the most commonly used pulping process because of the ability to recycle uh, the chemicals and also it produces the strongest uh, 
fibers for use in paper making. The craft process uh, is a high temperature, high pressure process. So besides being highly caustic with pHs approaching 13, uh, it is run uh, at elevated temperatures, 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And to maintain those pressures or to maintain those temperatures, you need to system needs to be under pressure. So that is the purpose of the craft digester is actually a pressure pressure vessel. Um, in pulping, uh, there's also then kind of backing up going to mechanical pulping. This is much simpler, where uh, literally a log is ground up, uh, and the common term for that is ground wood. Uh, sometimes this is augmented with uh, some chemicals. This makes a much weaker fiber and typically is used for things like newsprint and magazines. It's also one of the reasons why, if you think about newsprint, uh, newspaper, and you set it in the sun, it turns yellow because the majority of the lignans and organic materials are still in that sheet. But if you look at a newspaper, uh, it doesn't need a long lifetime. It's, it's read and, and thrown away or, or recycled. So a weaker sheet that won't age well is fine for those types of applications. Um, I think I've already mentioned bleaching, uh, and then recycle fiber I've mentioned as well. In the pulping operations, microbiocides uh, typically are not added with the exception of recycle fiber. Uh, the temperature and temperature pressure, pH conditions in pulping are such that the pulp uh, leaves the pulp mill basically sterile. So my, uh, antimicrobials are not used. They can be added later in the process uh, to help preserve. Again, going from words uh, back to a block diagram, and you've pretty much seen this already. So logs, the wood chips, the digester, chemical recovery as a separate unit operation, uh, washing bleach plant, uh, where recycled fibers also may need to be bleached. They may come into a bleach plant as well and onto the paper machine. So that's really I'm going to talk about pulping because there really is, is little to no use of microbiocides in the pulping operation. Now we get to paper making. Our diagram of the paper machine from the wet end to the dry end. And kind of as the names imply, at the wet end, we're starting with a slurry, uh, probably half a percent fiber in water, something in that range, between half and one percent. And at the dry end, we're ending with a sheet that's 95 to 98 percent uh, dry with two to five, five percent water in it. And we're going to go through each of these sections in a little more detail and talk about microbial use in each of them. First off, a picture of a paper machine. So you've seen the, the pretty diagrams. Now we get to the real world. And this also helps, I think, you understand, again, the scale and size of the paper making operation. So this is what we would call the head box, where it's putting out that jet of water onto the wire. So this is our forming section, also known as a Fordenier. Uh, that term comes from the two French brothers, the Fordenier brothers, who invented this technology in the late 1800s. Uh, uh, so in the forming section, uh, water drains either by gravity or they will have uh, uh, what's called vacuum boxes underneath sucking with a vacuum applied to suck more water out. Go to the press, the press felt I was talking about comes down, picks up the sheet, goes into the presses, and then the dryer section back here. From head box to reel is literally, can literally be hundreds of yards is how long these are. Um, paper machines come in different conditions. Uh, this is an older machine, probably very typical for the, of what you would find in the US. Here's a brand new paper machine. Uh, and this one looks a, a little different in that uh, it has a, what's known as a vertical former. Uh, thinking back to the previous slide, uh, so we, if you lay out your water on a a, a flat wire and it drains through, you can end up getting different properties in the top and the bottom of the sheet because solids tend to move to the bottom. Uh, and this, if you're think about if you're making a copy copy paper, 
get the same type of printing on both sides of that sheet. And if you think back to well, some of the cheaper copy papers, the package will actually have an arrow saying print this side because one side is better than the other. Uh, to overcome this, uh, they've taken the Ford near now and they put it vertical. So as the sheet is formed on the bottom, there are vacuum boxes applying vacuums on either side to suck the water out. It then goes to the press section and back onto the dryers. I think this gives you an idea of the scale too, if you look at these steps. So this is basically four stories tall uh, a paper machine. A modern paper machine like this, the, the width of the sheet will be on the order of 30 to 35 feet. Uh, the speed of the paper making, uh, again, depends on the grade. The lighter the grade, the faster. But generally, on the order of uh, a number to keep in mind would be 2,000 feet a minute. So that's roughly 60 miles an hour. So heavier sheets, slower, slower, 35 to 40 miles an hour. The fastest tissue machines are probably up to uh, 70 or 75 miles an hour. So that sheet, very sheet of paper in the forming section is just flying through this machine to the to the end. I'm going to talk now in spend quite a, a little time on this slide on the the wet end of the paper machine because this is something that is often referred to in the the applications uh, for biocides. Um, so paper is a very water intensive process. Uh, general, it takes 78,000 gallons of water to make one ton of paper. Uh, the good news is most of that water is recycled. So it's not 78,000 gallons of fresh water coming in to make one ton of paper. And we have some data I'll show you after this on how much fresh water is actually used. So if we're gonna look at the, the, the forming section. So here is our forming section. Here is the head box laying out this slurry onto the moving wire. So this is our, our moving wire here that the water then drains or has these vacuum boxes to suck it out. As I mentioned before, this could go straight up and down. It can go this way. You can have a second head box or a second uh, uh, wire on top of this. So there's a number of different configurations depending what type of paper you're making. So as the water comes out, it goes to what's known as the wire pit. Uh, this is typically called the wire, so the wire pit. And then as you get to the end of the machine, it goes to a separate chest called the, the seal pit. Uh, and I, I won't go into engineering. There was a reason it's called the seal pit because that water provided a seal to vacuum pumps later, but that's too much information you don't really need. Then there's the, the, the press section. So let's first talk about the short loop. So what comes off of uh, the forming section is known as white water, and particularly if you're making making a white grade of paper, it literally is brown grade of paper. It's brown because it still contains uh, some amount of fiber and the other materials um, in the sheet. This is si recycled right back to the front of the head box because the the pulp, and we'll get into the the what's known as the long loop in a minute is coming in at a, at a higher consistency. To form the sheet, uh, the slurry is generally between a half and 1% consistency. So this short loop is the dilution loop to dilute the, the pulp back down to the concentration you need to form uh, a proper sheet of paper. But there's more white water that comes off the sheet than is needed in the short loop. So this gets recycled in what's called the long loop. So this long loop goes back into our stock prep area and it's used to dilute any of the pulps either coming from the pulp mill or the recycle mill, uh, which are then blended in a blend chest. And as I mentioned before, they're cleaning operations or in the machine chest uh, to, to the head box. So again, we've got a long loop and a short loop. And you may see those terms used in registrations. The fiber that comes off of here, I mentioned before, is quite valuable. So there's a separate fiber recovery uh, unit operation. And it's uh, typically in a paper mill, it's called a save all. Again, paper makers weren't the most imaginative in naming some of their unit operations. So 
the save walls were designed to save all the fiber and get it back into the system. So that fiber that is reclaimed goes back in. Uh, water from the save wall, this shows goes to effluent in many mills now, this water is recycled back into the process. And this brings you back to the last point on this is fresh water. So we're seeing the two recycle loops, the short loop and the long loop. Fresh water is brought into the process generally as shower water. In the press sections and in the head box and, and other places, there are showers used to wash the felts and, and for other reasons. And that's your main source of fresh water use in the paper machine where it's coming in. There are some mills, actually there's only two in the U.S. that actually have zero effluent discharge. Everything in the mill is recycled. Uh, most mills <coughs> uh, do create a significant, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. In terms of water usage, uh, to give you an idea of, of actual fresh water uh, that's used in, in paper making. So here's uh, a chart from uh, Fisher database uh, showing water use by region. And one thing that strikes out is obviously North America on an average basis is the highest water use per ton, 12,000 gallons of water, fresh water brought into the mill per ton of paper. Uh, if you look at this by grade, different grades will have different uses uh, with packaging using more. And you'll probably notice there's a disconnect between these two gra graphs that if you look, okay, packaging is using about 8,000 gallons per ton, but in North America, we use 12. And that's because the data on the bottom is global data by grade, and the grade on the top is regional grade data over all grades. Um, so the key takeaways are different grades will consume different amounts of water, and that North America, uh, generally with older mills than the other regions in the world, has some of the highest water use per ton. But the trend in North America has definitely been to decrease the amount of paper. So here's a chart going back to 1975 up to uh, uh, 2014, it shows this uh, continuing trend to decrease the, the amount of water, uh, gallons of water used per ton of paper. And this trend is, is continuing in the US with uh, goals to reduce this uh, probably uh, again by another 50% or so in the, in the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, this is a, a good for the environment, but from the perspective of treating for microbiological or other treatments, it actually makes it a much more difficult situation as contaminants and other materials will cycle up in the system as less and less fresh water is used to, to purge them out of the system. So moving past our forming section, our wet end, we get to the press section. Um, so I will apologize, all the other diagrams I've shown would show the forming section on the left to the press section to the dryers on the right. This one is exactly backwards uh, with the forming section on the left and the dryer, or on the right, excuse me, and the, the dryers on the left. So here you can see this is our sheet. I mentioned the vertical former. So here we have a vertical former. Our sheet comes over to the, the press section, which has a number of different felts. So the first is called the pickup felt. Again, the, the very snappy naming by paper makers because it's used to pick up the sheet off of the wire onto the felt. It goes through the first press section. So the press is a nip between two rolls. The second press, is pressed against this granite center roll. The sheet goes around to the third press, and then finally the fourth press. Now, the purpose again is to pick up water, but we have to get rid of that water to reuse it because they're just running in a continuous loop. So there are cleaning showers, and then what's known as Yule boxes, uh, which are vacuum boxes that suck the water out of the felt so it's dry enough again to, to pick up water in. So this is again a point where fresh water is used on the on these felts. So going from the Ford near, you're generally around 10% solids coming out of the press section, 
depending on the grade, you're 35 to 50% solids. Uh, we go to the dryers uh, to get up to the final sheet dryness of 94 to 98%. So in the dryer section, um, well, I will back up one section. Uh, occasionally biocides are used in the shower water and it depends on the source. If the water is recycled water from that save all, uh, there may be some, there will be some biocide treatment in it. If it's fresh water use, uh, it will just be the fresh water as received from the, the influent plant. So in the dryer section, there are literate what are known as dryer. They are these long pressure cylinders. Uh, they're heated with pressurized steam. Uh, the sheet is pressed against it with what's known as the dryer felt, although it's really not a felt. It's more like the, the forming wire. It's actually heavier than that. And the sole purpose of the, the dryer felt is to hold the sheet against the heated dryer can. Uh, the surface of the dryer cans, because they're under pressure, can be upwards of 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, water in the sheet is driven off as steam, which is then vented through uh, hoods around the dryer section. Uh, the dryer conditions are such that it will kill all viable microbio, uh, with the exception of spores, which I'll mention later. So there are no biocides added to the dry section. Uh, also, the sheet coming off has no living bacteria or fungi in it. Uh, the temperatures in the dryers are high enough to deactivate or destroy most biocides as well. So that's our, our fundamental paper making, going from sheet formation, pressing, drying. And we get to finishing and coating. The most common type of coating is uh, with starch, it's, and it's done at something called the size press. Uh, the starch is added to the surface of the paper uh, to impart sizing, which is the uh, which is the absorption of water. So if you think about um, uh, writing uh, on a sheet of paper, if you have blotter paper and you, and you write with ink, it will feather out, which you don't want. So we add a little bit of sizing to the surface to keep that ink on the surface and give us a nice... Uh, form letter that we're, we're trying to get. So the size press is a fairly simple operation of two rolls with a puddle that the sheet is pulled through. It's located in the dryer section, and we'll talk more about the additives when we get there, but the key starch is the main, the, the most common uh, size, sizing additive, or surface sizing additive, and any excess starch here is recycled in a separate starch uh, loop in the machine. Uh, when we think of coated paper, though, you're probably thinking of the white, shiny paper that you would get on a, a magazine cover or on a fancy brochure coming in. It's a different type of operation where the, the sheet uh, is, is coated. Uh, you can kind of think of a paper coating as a paint. And if you look, this is our, our diagram here, really blown up of a sheet of paper. If you microscopically look at the surface of paper, not smooth. Even though it may feel smooth, on, on the microscopic and printing level, it's not. So we're adding the coating to give a very smooth layer. So we have our sheet, we're adding coating, and generally it's scraped off with a blade to give us this uh, uh, sheet with the, the great surface, the, the, the shiny surface, uh, best for printing. So Again, I, it's analogous to painting, but now you have to think of it in terms of paper making. We're going to be painting a wall 20 feet wide that's moving at 1,500 feet a minute, and you're not allowed to make any mistakes. The coating has to be perfect all the way across. You don't want any blemishes. It's not like pa painting your wall at home. So this would be a coater. This is the actual coater here, and from the coater, it goes to another dryer, which then dries it. So here you actually see dryers on both. You have to coat each side of the sheet separately. So there's probably another coater over here, coating the first side, dried, coat the second side, dried, this final sheet. Now the coating that's made, the coatings are 
very specific to each machine. And it's made in, again, what's called the coating kitchen, more of paper makers, great naming. Uh, so the coating kitchen is there to make up specific coating blends that are used and the blend will be different for each grade that's made. Uh, paper mills also are very secretive. This is their, their biggest trade secret is what goes into a coating formula because coating formulas are very sensitive. So very small changes in the coating formula uh, will impact the performance of that coater. And I mentioned before, it's, it's a requirement that the coating be 100% perfect with no, no defects. So typical coating kitchen, you can see the pipes for multiple additives that go in. The main component in coating is what's called uh, which is a slurry of either clays or calcium carbonate. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for the coating operation. The other unit operation in paper is utility. So it's not directly making paper, it's supplying, uh, help supply the inputs for it. So this would include the raw water coming in, uh, that surface water or well water, uh, waste treatment. Some mills in the south have cooling towers to lower the temperature of the recirculating process water. And then the boilers, uh, either the boiler used in the craft process or steam generating boilers that generate steam for the dryer sections and other parts of the paper making. Uh, there are antimicrobials used in these areas, but mainly the area we'll focus on is raw water treatment because that's again one of the raw materials in making paper. Cooling towers and boilers also can have microbial treatment, but those are covered under separate label uses in biocides. We're not really going to go into the, we're not going to go into those at all. Uh, raw water is normally treated with a halogen-based oxidizer, whether that's chlorine, uh, chloramine, uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite, bleach, that type of material. Uh, that's our real quick overview of the entire paper making process. And uh, when we originally did this presentation, we then got some questions, which I'll include here. So does the water removed from the press section get recycled in the shorter, long, or does it go to the effluent? Uh, I mentioned before the really the best practice is that water should go to effluent because it contains significant contaminants that are pressed out of the sheet. However, as these mills start reducing, they have to use less fresh water. And uh, one of the ways they can do that is by recycling the water coming off of the press section. So I would say now at least 50 to 80% of the water in press sections is recycled um, to um, uh, going to effluent. Uh, another question was how long does it take is this whole paper making process. So it's a continuous process, uh, but there are large storage chests at several points in the process. So the fiber may actually, you know, from when it comes in as a tree and goes out as a paper, that could be, be weeks. But uh, if you want to just kind of break it out for craft pulping, craft pulping is about an eight hour process from start to finish. If it's just craft pulping, uh, if you add bleaching, it probably adds in 12 to 15 hours. Uh, paper making, as you could, my earlier comments on the speed of paper making is very fast. Uh, it is at most minutes from the formation of the sheet to the dryer section, uh, and you and can often be well shorter than that, you know, well under a minute. Another question was about the pH in pulp and paper making. What are the pHs? And again, it varies depending on the unit operation and also the grade of paper being made. So craft pulping, uh, highly alkaline, pH near 13. Uh, wa the washing pipes reduce this pH to 10 to 11. Uh, if it's not bleached, if we're just going to use the brown fiber, they then will neutralize this with sulfuric acid before storage uh, to around a neutral pH. In bleaching, the pH is adjusted depending on the type of bleaching step. Uh, there, will, there can be two to three or four sometimes bleaching steps with different bleaching agents. Some require acid conditions, some require alkaline conditions. In any case, after final bleaching, the pH is adjusted back to near neutral for the pulp. 
Now, paper making is either what's called acid or al alkaline paper making. Acid paper making is a pH of four to four and a half. Alkaline, again, pa paper makers define alkalinity different than a ch chemist would. For a paper maker, alkaline paper making is, is seven to 8.4, 8.2 in, in that range is considered alkaline. Questions generated on, on that section. So now I'm going to move into a section on uh, paper chemicals or additives that are, are used in the paper making process. The additives can, can be divided into general classes. There are functional additives and process additives. Functional additives are, are, are named that because they actually impact the, the final sheet, the, the final sheet properties, whether that that's to give it better uh, printability or optical properties or strength. So some of the things there we'll talk about lower size, strength, dyes, retention aids. Process additives, on the other hand, do not directly impact the final properties of the paper sheet, but are added to improve the paper making process, to, to maintain or improve the efficiency of that process. And they include biocides, defomers, deposit control agents, cleaners, and dispersants. Fillers. Uh, after water and fiber, fillers are the most common additive in paper making. They are, in general, uh, clay or calcium carbonate. And also, if you use them in making, now they call them pigments, actually same materials, clays or calcium carbonates. Uh, a paper sheet, like a, a Xerox sheet, can contain up to 20% filler. And this is done because fillers, the clays and carbonates, are much less expensive than the fiber, which is costly to produce because of the pulping process. Um, it also can add some great properties to the sheet, improves the opacity, the smoothness, and printability. But there's a downside, it hurts the strength. It doesn't have the long fibers that the cellulose does, which is what gives it, gives it strength. The fillers are delivered by rail car as slurries. Um, some calcium carbonates are actually produced on site uh, where they uh, precipitate calcium uh, uh, with uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, they're held in gigantic storage tanks, which generally require or biocide, additional biocide treatment to preserve these slurries. So this is one of the, the areas of preservation or large area is for um, uh, fillers and pigments. I've mentioned sizing before. So sizing is added to limit penetration in a paper or board. So this is print, can improve printability, the example I gave before. Uh, glueability for boxes. You don't want the glue. You want the glue on the outside of the box, not inside. And obviously, if we're talking about a liquid container, uh, a milk carton or a coffee cup, uh, to be resistant to the penetration of water. Uh, sizing can be added at the wet end, which is called internal sizing, or coated on the sheet for surface sizing. Um, there are synthetic materials that are generally used in the, uh, the wet end for internal sizing. Uh, si uh, and is the most common uh, sizing agent for surface sizing. Um, there are also some synthetic polymers used. And in the, the next slide, I'll talk a lot more about starch, because uh, starch is... Uh, used in large quantities in paper making. The other additive, another additive that can be used is to improve the strength. And this is particularly in the, the box grades, uh, the liner board, uh, and so, some other grades and recycle grades. Um, different materials, there are some uh, to improve the, the paper strength. But again, our friend starch is the most common strength additive. Uh, there are synthetic polymers that can be used, uh, but they are more expensive to use than, than starch. And when we say starch, again, it's not a starch. There are many different types of starch. There are starches to make them cationic or anionic or amphoteric, all to provide different properties uh, for the paper maker to use. Now, starch is received as a dry powder, generally in rail cars, 
and the dry starch needs to be partially depolymerized so uh, to dissolve uh, and be useful in the paper making process. This is done via either cooking or an enzyme treatment with cooking, uh, and as the name implies, it's just heating the starch up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time to, to get this de depolymerization. So there is a separate subfunction of cookers, and this is an area where there's also significant biocide application. As you can imagine, starch is a very good food for microbiome. Uh, so these, the dry powder is slurry. That slurry can be held in tanks prior to cooking. You can see biocide treatment there. The cook to give the usable starch, um, and additional biocide is almost always required on the cooked starch to keep the microorganisms from growing, which if they do grow, it degrades the quality of the starch, uh, either to requiring the use of more starch or to the point where this, the starch is ineffective uh, for sizing or strength. Um, a couple of other process additives, uh, dyes, I'm not gonna say much about, I think it's pretty obvious dyes are added to dye the sheet to a different color. Um, uh, interestingly, even in a white sheet of paper, small amounts of dye are added because if you look at your copy paper carefully, you'll actually notice it's, it's actually a, a slight blue tint because we perceive blue as being whiter. Uh, so I'll say on dyes. Another process additive or functional additive is a retention aid. This is a high molecular weight polymer, cationic or anionic, that's added uh, prior to sheet formation. So think about again, we're, we're pouring this slurry out onto a wire to form our sheet, but we have different size material. If we have very small filler particles, very large fibers, we want to retain all of those. So we use these retention aid polymers to do that. Uh, the polymers are received either as a dry material or as an emulsion and have to be made down into a solution of 1% concentration or less. These made down polymer solutions are uh, often actually normally treated with biocide as a preservative to prevent microbial growth in them. So those are what we would call the functional additives. Now we get over to the, the process additives, again, not affecting for the, per the main purpose is not to affect the final sheet properties, but to improve the paper making process. Uh, the foamers, as the name implies, are to eliminate foam. Uh, you could think that in this paper making process, we have lots of recirculate, it gets aerated, it can create foam, it can entrain air, and all of that impacts the efficiency of the process. So the foamers are added. There are many different types of defomers, water-based, oil-based, silicone, surfactants, uh, and it really depends on the process conditions uh, where they're being used. Probably the, the largest use of defomers is it back in the pulp mill, but paper machines also use defomers to remove and trained air. Uh, defomers are generally preserved by the manufacturers received and no additional microbial treatment is needed. Uh, dispersants, there are some dispersants used to prevent uh, uh, scaling, uh, also in coatings, they uh, impact and improve the rheology of the, the uh, coating formulation. Um, in general, again, no additional biocide treatment is used in dispersants. On the cleaners, we're, now we start talking about the pulp. Uh, for as well as the, the pulps are washed and cleaned, they still bring uh, contaminants forward into the paper making process. Uh, these contaminants can be uh, organic, inorganic, or microbio, and they can form deposits. Uh, these deposits need to be removed to maintain the process efficiency, so this is typically done by cleaning. Uh, most of the cleaning is done during a machine stoppage. So they'll, they'll have a, a scheduled stoppage uh, and do what's called a boil out. Again, a, an ancient term, there's no boiling water. It's, it is hot water with chemical added and just recirculated to remove the impurities. And that cleaning water is then sent to, to effluent. Uh, some felts are cleaned on the fly, uh, while others are cleaned while there's, there's downtime. 
cleaners, uh, the types of cleaners or roof deposits really depend on the deposit being removed. You can have an alkaline cleaner, an acid cleaner, solvents or surfactants or combinations of any of the uh, uh, mentioned before. So it's just important to remember that uh, deposit removal is a critical aspect for wet end microbiome control. A deposit can trap bacteria and fungi, which gives them a home to start growing on surfaces. Conversantly, microbiome deposits can trap other contaminants in the, in the system. So periodic cleaning with a boil out is really a fundamental part of an overall deposit control program, whether that's organic, inorganic, or microbiome deposits. There are also chemical treatments uh, for deposit control, specifically non microbial uh, deposit control. Uh, so, first, one has to characterize where the what is the of the deposit. Is it organic components from the wood uh, or the recycle fiber? And again, terms paper makers use if organic deposit comes from wood uh, coming into the pulping is called pitch. If it comes in from a recycle, it's called a sticky. Uh, it's called a sticky because most of that are adhesives. So if you think you're recycling a box or an envelope, it has a glue on it or a post-it note, uh, those stickies can end up as contaminants in the paper making process. Uh, you can also get inorganic components, scales from calcium carbonate, barium sulfate, other materials, and the microbiome. If you analyze a deposit, you almost always find all of the components present just in different levels. Um, so the key becomes figuring out what is the root cause of the deposit. Many deposits are non microbio uh, in root cause. So these can be treated with a number of different strategies and whether it's dispersants, cationic polymers, surfactants, antiscalants. And we won't get into that, but it, it, it can be quite complex uh, in the type of treatment that's used. So I'll apologize ahead of time for this very busy diagram. The idea here is to show you, uh, I guess to reinforce the concept that different types of deposits can happen in different parts of the paper making process. And again, we're just focusing on, on paper making here, not, not pulping or finishing. So let me get a little oriented on this. It's our head box and forming section again. Silo is another name for the wire pit, and I apologize that paper makers like to have different terms for the same thing. Uh, going to the presses and out, and then we've got water coming to the fan pump. So this is our short loop again, and then going back to stock prep, which is our long loop. And what this graph is trying to show is that different areas are subject to different types of deposits. So if we look at the head box, you can have microbiome deposits, inorganic scale, or organic pitch. Whereas um, something like the, the cooch pit, you virtually never see a microbiome deposit. In other areas, you, you will s never see a scale deposit. So you can, I don't wanna go into a lot of detail on this, but it's an overall, uh, diagram to show you where some of the additives come into the process, gives you some more of the colloquial names used in paper making, the long and short loop, and the concept that different areas can be susceptible to different parts of deposit or different types of deposits. And that also dictates how you treat them. You try to before, right before a deposit form. So if, if the deposit is a scale in the head box, you may be treating right at the, the fan pump feeding the head box. Or if it's back in the machine chest, if it's a pitch deposit, you may be treating the stock coming to the machine chest. So that was our section on additives. Um, uh, can we talk about where starch and biocides are added? Well, we have a whole section coming up on where biocides are added, so I, I won't really go into that. And I think I've already covered where starch Starch can be added into the wet end for strength and internal. Uh, it also can be as a coating for surface sizing. Uh, biocide added to starch is, is often before and after uh, cooking 
for when it comes in the mill. The next section we're going to just briefly touch on some general microbiology. The paper making microbiome is really diverse. There are um, many different types of bacteria, fungi, sometimes algae uh, present. Uh, also want to note it is impossible to sterilize a paper making system. There are just too many inputs constantly contaminating the, the system. Um, an untreated paper machine uh, wet end would have upwards of 10 to the seventh uh, CFU per milliliter of bacteria. CFU stands for colony forming units. If you're not familiar with this, R, uh, but it, it's the standard measure for microbial activity. Uh, and the test would be shown something on the right with a petri dish where you make um, successive dilutions of the water you're testing with sterile water to get to the point where you can count individual colonies. So that dilution is spread paint, it's allowed to grow for not some number of days, and then you literally count the number of colonies it formed, thus the name colony forming unit. So 10 to the seventh, that's, we're talking billions per milliliter is a typical untreated. Uh, successful treatment will lower that to 10 to the three to four, so 1,000 to 10,000 per milliliter. Uh, classic Human pathogens like E. coli are virtually never found in paper making systems. And different parts of the system will support different types of organisms. Uh, you can have aerobic bacteria and fungi, uh, anaerobic, filamentous, and algae. And we'll talk uh, briefly about each one of these. So, bacteria, different types of bacteria in paper making systems. And bacteria are by far the most common microbiological contaminant. Uh, Bacteria can be divided up by whether uh, they are aerobic, requiring oxygen for growth, anaerobic, requiring the strict absence of oxygen for growth, uh, or facultative bacteria that, that can go either way, grow in uh, moderate oxygen environments and anaerobically. Um, some of these bacteria, whether they are aerobic or anaerobic, uh, can be filamentous, forming long fibers. There's a specific type of filamentous bacteria uh, that use sulfur and iron to form, or, or form sulfur, and, you, yeah, excuse me, use sulfur and iron to form uh, 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 iron sulfide type deposit. And then there's slime forming bacteria. Um, detail about that, but many different types of bacteria uh, can form slimes. They are ubiquitous to the environment, found everywhere. Um, the impacts of uh, bacteria, and we'll get more, we actually have another section on this, but corrosion deposits, plugging, uh, and uh, generally poor operation. Fungi in paper making. Uh, fun fungi and yeast are generally much larger cells than bacteria. Uh, mold is the most common, it prefers acidic condition. So earlier I mentioned acid or alkaline paper making. So earlier in my career, acid, uh, acid paper making was predominant. So our, one of our main microbial issues was dealing with molds. Uh, now the pendulum has swung where alkaline paper making is predominant. There's very little acid paper making Bacteria usually are a bigger concern. Um, there are filamentous forms of fungi, and again, the same types of deposit or same types of impacts. Uh, yeast uh, can grow in neutral and slightly uh, acidic conditions, and these can be very large structures. Uh, those structures can serve to trap other materials in the system very easily and form very tenacious sheets or, or films. Algae, I think everyone's familiar with green algae sitting on a pond. Uh, it's a large group of photosynthetic organisms. They're green, sometimes yellow. And generally you don't find them very, don't find them much in paper making. There may be some uh, overspray areas, moist areas that are exposed to light or possibly in a freshwater clarifier uh, coming into the mill, but the rest of the mill is not in sunlight. It's on an enclosed building. So algae is, is not, terribly common. If it is there, it can lead to nozzle plugging, filter plugging, and sheet defects. 
Now let's go to slime or biofilms. Um, back to our bacteria. The bacteria, the same bacteria, so this is not a different bacteria. Even bacteria can exist in two different states. It can be free swimming in the aqueous solution, that's called a planktonic bacteria, or it can attach to surfaces, which is known as the sessile form of the bacteria. Same bacteria can be planktonic or sessile. Uh, the different states have dramatically different metabolisms, and they will express proteins differently. The um, bacteria form the biofilms actually to change their environment to make it more hospitable for their growth. So biofilms are slimes formed by, first there is an initial attachment uh, bacteria to the surface. Uh, they then start producing polysaccharides, which is what is called the slime um, layer as uh, basically their house, a defensive environment for them to live in. Uh, these polysaccharides, the slimes can attract other contaminants, other deposits. If you look at a slime deposit and characterize the bacteria present, you will find many different types of, of bacteria or fungi and yeast in there. As the slimes grow, they get to a certain point where they are either mechanically sloughed off into the process or they break apart to release bacteria to planktonic form. And this is what gives our cycle of going from attachment to initial growth fully formed biofilms and then release back into the system. Um, one of the, the first indications of slime growth is actually physical. Uh, the surfaces tend to be very slippery. And actually when I've trained uh, uh, people in paper machine microbiocontrol, I tell them an, an important part is to uh, put on a pair of gloves and run your hands uh, along some of the wetted surfaces in the wet end of the, the paper machine. And you can feel the slipperiness if there's a microbiome deposit. The, the slimes are not microscopic. These can be very low. A couple of pictures here. This one may be hard on the right to understand, but it's actually a tank. So it's a cylindrical tank. There it is. This is a pipe coming into the tank. Uh, you can see the opening, overflow opening into the tank, but you can also see the surface with all this orange material on it. Um, slimes tend to be pink or orange in paper making, and that's just due to the types of bacteria that are uh, normally present. Um, but you can see again from these pictures that this is not a microscopically thin it, it can be very thick, and particularly as it traps other materials in the system. So that was our real brief primer on uh, microorganisms that are present, what we're going to treat for, and why we're treating. Uh, I will go back and mention on biofilms. The biofilm control is the large use of biocides in the paper making. Uh, in this section, there were no specific questions uh, raised in the original presentation. So now we'll dive a little deeper into the issues caused by microbiomes, which microbio, uh, which why we are are going to treat these. So the first is holes, breaks, sheet defects. Uh, so again, here we have this would be the wire up here, the forming section. So this is underneath where the water is coming down to go down to the the wire below. And you can see the whiskers of slime growing there. Uh, uh, but if these were to break off, or when they do break off, not if, uh, and get into the system, they can create holes in the sheet of paper or uh, defects you know, shown by, by spots. Modern paper machines actually have online hole and defect counters. So they have real-time measurements of the amount of defects, the size, and whether there are holes present or not. Uh, machine performance is the the big issue, particularly for biofilm control. That uh, if you uh, 
continue to develop issues, particularly holes, slimes. And if they're bad enough, uh, you'll actually get the sheet break and have to stop the entire process to rethread the, the paper sheet through the, the paper machine. So that decreases the efficiency of the machine. Now, I mentioned paper making is a 24 seven operation. It's been 24 seven since before the computer people said that was a really cool term to describe them. And paper machines being the large capital investment they are, um, need to run at over 90% efficiency, and that's 350 days a year. So uh, any decrease in machine performance has a real material impact on the, the paper mill. Another issue that comes up is odor. Uh, uh, it says some aerobes, but it's mainly facultative anaerobes and anaerobic uh, bacteria produce end products that have a really strong and offensive odor. Uh, and some of these odors stick with the fiber going out. Uh, one of them is called uh, geosimin, and this is a musty, earthy odor. Uh, interesting aside that uh, it's actually a genetic predisposition whether you can smell this odor or not. Uh, one place it will occur is on like uh, the sponge on your, your kitchen sink uh, uh, that after sitting there for a few days kind of has a, this musty odor to it. And I can tell you that... Uh, I'm very sensitive to that. I can smell that. My wife is not. She doesn't smell it. So it's, it really is dependent on the person. The bigger issue generally comes with volatile fatty acids, uh, butyric, propionic, acetic acids. These can have really horrendous odors. Uh, and if they carry forward, so uh, they've been described as baby poop or locker room. So imagine if you're getting a pizza box and the box is... is imparting that delicious locker room smell to your pizza, it's it's a very bad for the, the paper maker. Um, also, there are anaerobic bacteria that can create hydrogen sulfide, which is extremely toxic, so it can be a health hazard. The, the other thing with VFAs, uh, with anaerobic bacteria, can further digest VMA, uh, volatile fatty acids, to uh, uh, methane and hydrogen. And there have been a number of uh, explosions, including fatal accidents because of this. The example shown here was back in 2008 at the uh, mill in Tomahawk, Wisconsin, owned by the, the PCA Packaging Corporation of America. Uh, they were in their annual one week shutdown and were doing maintenance on top of a, uh, a stock storage chest. Um, they were doing some welding on top. Uh, they didn't believe there was any way for the sparks to get inside the chest, so they did not test for an explosive environment. But the environment went anaerobic and created a large amount of hydrogen. Uh, sparks found their way into the tank and it exploded. That missing piece of tank was blown um, something like 150 yards away and into a parking lot and three people were killed. So. Uh, Control of uh, VFAs and anaerobic uh, bacteria really is a very important issue in the paper industry, in, e in every industry, actually. Uh, pulp degradation. Uh, there are some bacteria that produce uh, cellulase enzymes, which can degrade. I mentioned before, in, in general, pulp, um, high-density storage of pulp is not treated with biocides. Uh, as it moves further into the paper making area and is diluted to the three to six percent level, it it may be treated. Uh, the one exception to this during a mill shutdown, uh, where the pulp is going to be stored for length long length of time, it may be treated before shutdown. Uh, MIC or microbiologically induced corrosion is common in many different industries for uh, bacteria. Uh, so it's against the slime formation. The bacteria form a colony on the surface uh, with a protective layer. The colony then produces acidic uh, and corrosive materials, which directly attack the metal surfaces they're uh, attached to. This is not as common in paper. You do see it occasionally in some other industries. Additive spoilage is another big area for uh, biocide use. Uh, I already, we've already gone through the long section on the different types of additives that are used, and they basically need to be preserved. If they're not, you can see depressions in pH. 
uh, changes in viscosity, odors, and in some cases you just see uh, performance of the additive uh, decline, so you need to use more of it. So many of the different additives, as I showed in the, the additive section, uh, require additional biocide treatment. Uh, this also uh, applies to a paper coating formula when it's made. So we think back to the coating kitchen. We're making up a batch of coating formula. It goes to a tank, and it may be they may be on using that coating for a day or two days. So during that period of time, it has required some additional treatment. Uh, degradation of all the various additives in there. And if you recall, I mentioned those coatings are very sensitive to composition. So uh, making sure microbial growth doesn't happen in, in the coating color is uh, important. Uh, one last thing, I mentioned just the name earlier, endospores. Uh, there are s some bacteria that when stressed, uh, in other words, they're, they're getting, they're in an environment that is very unhealthy form will create what's known as an endospore. Uh, so you can kind of think of this almost as the seed. It's no longer exactly a living viable bacteria, but it's more of a seed that's resistant to uh, chemicals and temperatures. The endospores are the only thing that will survive the temperature in the drier section of the paper machine uh, and can be present in the final product. The only place endospores, the only grades endospores are food packaging grades, i.e. like a milk carton, juice carton, things like uh, boxes uh, for microwave food. Uh, for uh, milk cartons, there is what's known as the dairyman standard, which requires the determination of the of uh, endospores or bacteria levels in the final sheet of paper or per, and there's a, a limit set by um, per gram of final weight. Um, endospores are very difficult to treat, uh, are, are very, very difficult to treat chemically. So the, to control endospores is generally to control them before they are formed in the sheet. And I'm not going to go into that because there's really a very limited number of mills in the U.S. that have programs for endospore treatment, but they do tend to be the most biocide intensive programs of any paper mill. Uh, mentioned briefly influent water, again, coming from well or surface water, and particularly with surface water, you always are bringing bacteria into the mill, a bacteria, fungi, whatever. So these need to be treated. Um, there'll be filters, uh, also then uh, microbio treatment, generally with a a halogen-based material. If untreated, they just serve as a continuing um, uh, injection of bacteria into the, the system. Uh, water, again, is the largest raw material, or one of the largest raw materials we're making. So if you're continually bringing contaminated water in, you're just increasing the amount of microbial contamination in the system. Effluent, um, most of the, almost all of the paper mills have a uh, waste treatment system. This is normally a waste-activated sludge system, and some filamentous bacteria in that system can cause what's known as, as bulking of the activated sludge, which makes it difficult to, to recycle that sludge into the system. Um, so on very rare occasions, microbiotes, uh, biocides are used in effluents, but for the most part, they're, they're not. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, is just a general safety concern. You know, we mentioned that the slime is, sl sl uh, slime or biofilm is, sl and if you have overspray areas near the paper machine, like this one here is a, is a step with, and you can see the, the pink orange slime on it. Uh, that's just a slip safety hazard for workers in the mill. So it's another reason um, to look for microbial control. So again, this section had no, no specific questions in, when we first did the presentation. So I'll move on from there. So it was just a, a general overview of all the issues caused by uh, the microbiome in the paper system. So now we'll get more specific in biocides used in 
manufacturing. Um, from the, the supplier's point of view, we, we mentally classify biocides into two broad classes as the organics or the oxidants. So the organics are called organics because of the basic carbon backbone, and sometimes they'll also be called proprietaries. Uh, they have different modes of action. Uh, some are broad spectrum. Uh, many have much narrower spectrum on, on what bacteria fungi they will treat. Uh, the efficacy is certainly dependent on the environmental conditions, the concentration, and the contact time. Uh, oxidants are spectrum nonspecific. They are literally oxidizing bacteria, removing electrons uh, from the substance. Uh, their efficacy is, a, again, impacted by environmental conditions. One thing I uh, mentioned, you're probably familiar with pH and temperature, but maybe not familiar with ORP. ORP is the oxidation reduction potential. Uh, so this is a, a measurement it's made by an electrode that shows whether your system is oxidative or reductive. So for example, if you take uh, distilled water, aerate it, you'll have an ORP of about plus 400. It's oxidative. And then if you add uh, two ppms of chlorine to that, it becomes much more oxidative and will have an ORP of 700. Uh, versus if you are uh, doing an anaerobic fermentation, uh, i.e. making beer, uh, you'll have an ORP of negative 400. So there is, the scale is zeroed uh, at the, the break between oxidative and reductive. And that's important because with oxidants are consumed in a reductive environment. So if you have a negative ORP, that will consume oxidants before they can be effective against bacteria or fungi. Uh, so ORP is particularly important on oxidants. Also, many of the organic biocides are neutralized in a low ORP situation. There are a limited number of biocides like uh, Dazimet, MBT, that are effective in uh, negative ORPs. The major classes of biocides, and I'm not going to spend any detail on this. Uh, what we did was in Appendix 1, we created a each one of these uh, biocide types. Um, so if you want more details, uh, you can go there. If I went through all 20 of those slides or not, I'm sure everyone would be asleep at the, uh, the end of it, including myself. So organosulfurs would be the, uh, the carbamates, thione, sulfones, thiocyanates, uh, isothiazolins, which are probably the most common in that class, uh, bromines, DBMPA, uh, bronopol, are probably the most uh, common there than the, the quats and then glutaraldehyde. I'll talk a little bit more about biocides because now probably well over 80% of the paper machines are using oxidizing biocides, uh, well, maybe 70%, but something in that, that range. Uh, so these could be gaseous chlorine, sodium hypochlorite, hypobromous acid, uh, some of the halogen sta stabilizers, uh, chlorine dioxide, or the chloramine uh, chemistries. With oxidants, um, some of the things that are common is they're all corrosive to one extent or another. And with the exception of the chloramines, they basically all can have a significant impact on all the other additives that are used in the papermaking process. So they can impact dyes or retention aids and, and lessen the effectiveness of those materials. Uh, also, with the exception, again, exception of chloramines, uh, the, um, the by some heavy metals, which will catalyze their destruction. And uh, they're all impacted by reducing agents or negative ORP. Uh, chlorine and bromine, bromine-based, uh, also can generate AOX and THMs. Uh, try here. So this is another potential downside and another reason why uh, chloramines particularly have become uh, the predominant class of biocides used in that they have uh, little or no contribute, contribution to AOX formation, little or no uh, impact on other added. 
Now, some of the oxidants are fed as received, while others have to be generated on site. Uh, the ones that have to be generated on site are generally due to either have very short shelf lives or there are very large safety concerns about transporting them. That would be the case for chlorine dioxide. DOT regulations do not allow the, the transportation of chlorine dioxide solutions. So um, the, the common oxidants used as received are chlorine, sodium hypochlorite, BCDMH, DCDMH. And the ge ones generated on site will be chlorine dioxide, hypobromous acid, chloramines, and the MCDMH, the uh, DMH stabilized chlorine. So that was the, the real quick overview of the biocides currently used in papermaking. And as I said, in the appendix, there is a, a more details for each one of these. Uh, we did get some questions here. So the um, question was, uh, can you please describe how biocides are measured to be applied in the process? Some manufacturers want to list the dilution rates based on the label in terms of PPM of product in the system or PPM of product per ton or other dilution amounts. Uh, does this make sense uh, to the application? Uh, so in, in answering to this, uh, I pointed out that, that some parts of the system, the tank volumes and flow rates are accurately known. You know, for example, if you're presenting a, a starch slurry, uh, you have a coming out of the starch cooker, you've got a flow meter, you know exactly how much is flowing, so you can feed a, a set PPM amount based on that, that flow rate. In other areas, it's very difficult to know what the actual volumes and constant or, or flow rates are in the system, such as in, in the short loop. So in those areas, it makes feeding on a PPM basis very difficult. However, you always know what the stock flow is and what the paper production rate is. So you can then set your dosage on those. Uh, the one exception to this for, particularly for this wet end, would be for the use of halogen-based oxidizers, whether that's a chloramine or some other hal halogen, because there are very simple on-site tests that you can measure the actual concentration of the halogen in the system. So this allows you to apply them PPM basis to the wet end, where maybe with another organic biocide, uh, you can't accurately the, you can't measure the, on, the concentration on site, so you rely on a, a dosage based on the stock flow or the, or the uh, uh, final paper production. Another question was, I'm assuming process is an open system, uh, including when the biocide is being, uh, it, including when the biocide is being owed to the slurry or coating. And, and, and this is actually not true. The majority of the paper ring system is a closed system. Uh, biocides are added to closed tanks, and that includes the, the, the coatings and, and slurry areas. If you go back to that picture of the coating, system, uh, coating kitchen, uh, you'll see that is a closed tank with multiple lines running into the tank. The one area that, that would be considered open is the wet end or, or form the paper machine. And biocides are, are often added into the short loop, which will be onto that open forward near. Uh, I guess another part of the process can, you would consider open is the pulper in a recycle plant. Um, the, the, these are open vessels, I, kind of like a, a, a KitchenAid mixer on steroids where the, the, the waste paper is fed in, uh, mixed with water and beaten up. But here, biocides generally are never added to the pulper. They're added to the discharge pipe of the pulper. So it's more of a closed system. And in the rest of the, the application points are either into pipes or into chest, uh, closed chests. So the vast majority of the applications are really into a closed system. Uh, another question that was asked was, do paper mills have the capacity to measure air concentration of biocide and biocide degradants in the paper mills only have very rudimentary analytical capabilities. Any sophisticated analytical measurement like this would need to be conducted in an outside lab. Uh, another question uh, asked that I mentioned uh, the use of biocides to preserve paper. And 
Biocides are not added to preserve the paper. Biocides are in that class of process additives where they are improved to, they are added to improve the processing efficiency for the paper. The one exception to this that I'm aware of is the addition of fungicides in gypsum board, um, and that is to pre prevent, um, uh, in part, mold resistance to the final sheet. And there was actually a, a follow-up question that asked, well, how is mold-resistant paper made? Is the biocide embedded in the paper or is it a coating? Uh, in general, the fungicide is added in the wet end, so it is embedded throughout the entire sheet. Uh, surface coating is, would be insufficient to prevent uh, the mold from beginning growth inside the sheet. So that was the, the questions on the biocide area. So now we'll get more specific on application of biocides um, in paper making. And again, back to our, our overall process, very little used, almost none used in pulping, with maybe the exception of treating um, recycled fiber after it's been repulped. Um, utilities, the only application we're really interested in is in the raw water treatment. So our focus is on paper making. So uh, a deposit microbiome control program. And again, you can't really separate one from the other, as pointed out. If you get a microbiome slime deposit, it will trap other things. But the general principles are it starts with housekeeping, inspection, cleanup, you know, wash ups, meaning take a hose and wash down an area, boil outs, that's the, the cleaning done during a downtime. Next 15% is optimized operation. And I won't go into details because we could spend the day talking about things the paper maker can do their operation to minimize uh, uh, microbiome growth. And then finally, the last 25% is the biocide program itself. And that depends on the three R's, which is the right biocide at the right addition point and at the right addition rate. Uh, So if we go into how do I, you know, me personally, I don't do this anymore, but how would you develop a microbiome control program? So first it starts with an overall system survey. So we need to have flow diagrams to know all the, the flows of water and stock in a system. I've shown simplified diagrams that you know are very easy to follow, that we have the short loop goes here and the long loop goes there. You get to the real world, it's way more complex. There are many different sub loops uh, machines have been modified over the years so what they th thought was going here may be going there uh, so it's important to update and understand uh, all the flows in the paper machine the types of furnish being used the type of water the influence sources coming in the amount of fresh water or degree of closure and then we look at profiles across the system of ph temperature and orp because they will change in different parts of the system. And then finally, we actually do measurements of the microbiome uh, uh, organisms present uh, throughout the system. So we develop an overall snapshot of the conditions of the system, the flows in the system, and where the microbiome contaminants are. And you can't do this just once. You need to do it multiple times because conditions change in a paper machine. Uh, so next, we start looking at based on that first set of information, because we also have pH, ORP, temperature, whatnot, we have to decide which biocides to use. Uh, so one of the issues is incompatibility. Uh, biocides are incompatible with each other. So uh, the, the classic example is uh, thione or dazimet with the isothiazolines, the MIT uh, uh, CIT blends. Uh, in a coating formulation, if you have these two biocides present, uh, they will precipitate and form little fisheye gels that creates defects in the coating. Uh, and again, there are other biocides, the uh, um, dazmet glutaraldehyde, uh, dazmet thione, and a couple other biocides. But there's also other incompa chemical incompatibilities you have to look at, such as if uh, the mill is using a bisulfite uh, or a reductive bleaching and they're carrying some uh, bisulfite residual, that will... Uh, uh, impact the activity of most of the biocides that are added. As I mentioned earlier, there's only a couple of biocides that are effective under reductive conditions. Uh, 
is not effective with a lot of uh, in, in uh, excuse me, glutaraldehyde can have a negative impact on some in, uh, enzymes. I've already mentioned the uh, negative or low ORP. Uh, lastly, quats are um, will react with any anionic additive and lost. So we get past that. Then we get to the the biggie for the paper maker is cost effectiveness. Um, they are looking to get the biggest bang for their buck if you can. The, so the overall program must be cost effective and must demonstrate that uh, the, the value for elimination of, of defects and improving machine performance. So then based on all of these, we start putting together the treatment strategy. So it's going to be the biocide, the feed points, whether we feed continuous or intermediate or intermittent and the control parameters. I'll go talk a little bit more about intermittent feed. Um, if you look at uh, bacteria, and in an earlier version or, of this presentation, we had more information on bacteria growth curves. But uh, bacteria don't grow in a linear fashion. If you were to have a uh, number of bacteria versus time, so you have bacteria on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, you end up with an S-shaped curve. So there's an induction phase, the exponential growth phase, and then it levels off. Uh, what that allows you to do is to treat biocides intermittently. The goal is, is to keep the population below a certain level. Uh, you don't have to feed continuously to do that. You can feed every, you know, and these timelines are generally in the order of hours. So you can feed every three or four hours uh, and still have them in the, uh, induction phase and not in the exponential growth phase. So that's why intermittent feed can be used, and it's a question of whether you need continuous or intermittent, intermittent feed, and that depends on a lot of different uh, items. So now let's talk specifically, because mentally, again, we can break this down on three different um, things we're trying to control. We can do planktonic control, sessile control, And I'm, I've lost the third one, but we'll get back to it. So planktonic control. So this is the free-floating organisms. So it'll happen both in the influent water and the process water, which can be the shower water, whatever. Uh, it can be initiator of biofilm and, and odor producers. So the influent water is probably the, the biggest planktonic control. Um, and that, again, is generally done with uh, oxidizing bio of, of one type or another. Um, as a, a feed control loop, uh, these can be set up on feedback control uh, measure the, based on ORP or other online measurements. Um, for planktonic control, oxidants are preferred for shower waters. Uh, organics can be used. Uh, and again, if we go back in, in history, back to the days of acid paper making, organics were predominantly used in the, uh, the short loop uh, for uh, free swimming and biofilm control. Um, where now oxidants are certainly the preferred method. Uh, preservation, that was the third one, preservation. So, Again, we have all these various additives. We want to preserve them. Uh, if we don't, the microbial growth will lead to depressed pH, uh, discoloration, odors, change in activity. Uh, this is almost exclusively done with the organic biocides, isothaslins, bronopol, glute, DBMPA, uh, thione. And the main reason for that is the uh, persistence. Uh, oxidizing biocides are normally rapidly consumed in the system by things other than the bacteria. Uh, and if we want to preserve something over an extended uh, timeline, we need things with a, a longer half-life with better persistence in the system. So the organic biocides are almost always used in the additive preservation. These can be applied during the, the makedown, i.e. of a starch slurry. Uh, uh, also during offloading, I mentioned like clay and carbonate 
brought to the mill in rail car or in some case uh, barges and ocean ships. So as it's offloaded into the large storage tanks, uh, it's treated there. And there are, are many of the additives that are kept in a storage or run tank that, that may be treated. There are times when uh, the microbial control is lacking and uh, you start to get significant growth. So a shock application, a one-time application of much higher biocide levels may be required to get back into control. Uh, preservation of the thick stock, again, normally coming from thick stock is not preserved with the exception being of uh, a recycle fiber coming from the recycle plant. <laughs> Uh, added, uh, preservatives are almost always added to that because of the uh, uh, contaminants in recycle. I mean, you're basically using garbage to make paper there. So you can envision there, there's a high microbial loading coming in in recycle, where from a pulp mill, there's almost zero microbial loading. Um, as we get to the paper mill, then thick stock takes on a different nature. It's not, not the same as coming from the pulp mill. Now it's been slightly diluted down to this three to four and sometimes this is preserved. It's generally uh, done with organic biocides. Um, but in recent years, there's been uh, some use of oxidants or mixes of oxidants and organics going into the thick stock preservation. Biofilm control, as mentioned earlier, is by far the largest use of biocides in paper making. Uh, the biofilms, again, have already been mentioned, are not homogeneous. They accumulate everything else possible in the system, and they lead, lead to most of the, the major described in the, in the defect section. Because of the nature of biofilms, there are many organic biocides are not very effective. And the problem is penetrating the biofilm, the polysaccharide layer, to get to the actual organisms producing it. The same is true of some of the oxidants, uh, hypochlorite or hypobromous. These are very strong oxidizing agents, so they tend to react with the polysaccharides before being able to reach the bacteria themselves. So they are actually consumed before they can do the job killing the, the bacteria present. Um, the exception to this are the chloramines and MCDMH, the monochlorodimethyl hydantoin, uh, hydantoin stable chlorine, have both been shown to, to readily penetrate biofilms without being consumed. So these are the chemistries that are typically favored in biofilm uh, control applications. I've already talked about endospores, they're heat resistant. Uh, and endospores themselves are very biocidal resistance. Uh, hypochlorite and glutaraldehyde have been shown to have uh, some sporicidal activity, but the usage rates are enormous uh, to the point of either exceeding label usage or just not being economically viable. So the objective in an endospore program is uh, heavy control of biofilm and planktonic bacteria earlier in the system to prevent them from being able to form the, the endospores uh, later in the system. And I'm going to try to put this all together with an, an example. This is a biofilm control example because um, I know there's always questions on where do we add biocides. Well, it's generally not in one spot. Again, there's these multiple water loops with different retention times, different pHs, potentially different ORPs. So they're going to have some different demands. So in this case, and this is a, an actual case I took. So at the, the silo or the wire pit, we're adding one, one type of oxidizer on an intermittent basis, a 20 minute, 20 to 30 minute cycle targeting a two to, PP, two to three ppm concentration. Same thing in the shower water chest. The blend chest is that uh, intermediate thick stock chest right before uh, the paper maker. This we're going to uh, treat continuously at a low level. Uh, the same also then the white water chest, a little bit going 
of an organic biocide then going into high density storage. We mentioned that the need there and why we pick an organic. And then the broke chest, a mixture of both the organic and the oxidizer. Um, so this is one typical program that would be developed for biofilm control. So, and the program will be specific to every mill. You can't take the same program plug it into the next paper machine. You have to go back to the beginning there and do your homework uh, on the, uh, the system and design the appropriate uh, program for that system. So we didn't get specific questions here. I think some of them are covered elsewhere. So we'll just kind of press on. So now we're going to get into exposure uh, of biocides and paper making. Uh, first, I want to talk about the role of the service company and the, the service company, uh, such as that I work for, Chimera, um, in the paper industry, play a huge role. Uh, most of the paper mills are not buying individual biocides, not most, virtually all of the paper mills are not buying individual biocides. What they're buying are treatment control programs from a service company. And the, ser the main service companies are... Uh, Herc, Nalco, Chimera, and Buckman. Between those four, we probably treat 95% of the paper mills in, in the U.S. So the service company is the actual, turns out to be the actual applicator of the biocide and not the customer themselves. So they're responsible for designing the program as it going, going through all that survey step, everything else. So it's going to be raw water, biofilm, preservation application. They also train the mill employees on the treatment programs, advise on the best handling of the uh, neat bias, the as-received biocides come in. And in many mills, the responsibility for the biocide handling is given 100% to the service company uh, technical representative. Uh, they also develop uh, safety discussions for the mill and measure and report microbial control results so basically, they, they demonstrate the performance of their program and work with the mill people. I mentioned earlier, there are many operational things the, the mill can do to minimize uh, microbial growth, and they act as consultant for the mill in these areas. In terms of safe handling, uh, biocides are co covered under the OSHA Hazard Communication Act and in Canada under the uh, Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Uh, Neither of these require respiratory protection uh, in, a, in a paper mill. Uh, actually, let, let me clarify that. When uh, handling neat biocides, uh, respiratory re protection is not required, but proper PPE is always required. Talk a little about getting away from the service company people now to the actual mill operators. And again, just some some terms. Uh, machine tender is in the wet end area. He, uh, they're the ones who generally monitor the, the, the wet end production, I guess is the easiest way to say that. Um, recycled paper worker works back in the recycle plant. So he's responsible for getting the, the recycled pulp loaded, get it pulped up and get it sent forward. Um, uh, recycle uh, uh, back to the paper machine, the back tender uh, is responsible for the, the operations past the press section. So once you get to the dryer section, back to the uh, where the paper is wound, that's the back tender. And then there's a separate crew that does uh, rewinding of the paper. As the, the sheet comes off the paper machine, it, it's the next operation is to rewind it basically in a neater, tighter wind uh, that's usable by the, the final finishing and converting operations. And if you look at uh, how many workers or exposure is, and I'm not going to go through all of these. You can, you can read each one. But the, the bottom line is there's actually fairly limited time exposure to the paper machine. Uh, paper machines now are highly automated, so the operators spend the majority, the vast majority of their time in the control room and only a small amount of time actually on the machine floor or working with the machines. Now, again, it depends on the um, which operation the recycle the guy running the recycle plant will spend more time because he's responsible for physically loading uh, the pulper 
uh, and whereas the uh, machine tender is spending 90% of his time in a control room monitoring the, the production. Um, in terms of, of exposure potentials, uh, it, in general, it's low. We've already talked about most of the operator time is spent in the uh, uh, in, in control rooms, and that most of the system is a closed system, with the exception of the the wet end of the paper machine. Um, also, another point to mention that biocides are only used uh, when the machines are in operation. Uh, uh, I mean, that sounds kind of obvious, but um, the paper machine can have parts of the machine operating while other parts don't. And you say, how does that work? So let's again think about the, the Ford near section. And later on, back in the dryer section, we have a sheet break. The sheet, the sheet breaks is no longer making. They will keep the, the Ford near the forming section running while the, the rear section is closed and being rethreaded. Uh, so you can have one part of a paper machine running and not, another not. The biocide programs are set up with interlocks so that they only feed that part of the machine they are feeding is in operation. And if it's not in operation, they are automatically interlocked to be uh, turned off. Uh, I already mentioned the PPE, if you're dealing with the neat biocides is required. Um, thermal exposure to white water, um, there is some potential exposure to that. Uh, again, general PPE, I mentioned using gloves, and there is uh, really uh, little contact with it. Inhalation exposure is unlikely in that paper machine environment, even the, the forming section, which is open, is extremely well ventilated. And obviously, this is deliberate because it's a high humidity operation. Uh, they don't want corrosion from humidity and also condensation, which could drip down and cause sheet defects. Um, leaks or spills, again, this is kind of standard for almost any chemical application, but uh, PPE and safety training, uh, maintenance of equipment, uh, again, that's done during, during shutdowns and PPE is always required. Um, to give you an idea of what a uh, biocide feed system looks like, the uh, here I have a picture on the right. Uh, obviously, it's a Chimera feed system, and this is a chloramine generation system. So it has uh, the Chimera um, registered product on the left and sodium hypochlorite on the right, sitting on three separate containment areas. I know it looks like one, but it's actually three separate compartments. So if there is a spill from, uh, this is actually the mixing unit in the middle. If there's a spill from either any one of these three, it is kept separate. So the two materials are brought into the mixing unit. It is uh, PLC, which is a small computer controlled unit that mixes the two in the appropriate amount and sends it off. Uh, this unit can actually feed six different feed points, again, under computer control. So if we go intermittent feed, we can feed one point, then the next point, then the next point. And that's very typical for biocide. The, uh, the neat biocides are not stored here. The general setup is a mother tote, which is then has a, a transfer tote brought to it. So as this tote is drawn down, biocide is transferred into it in a closed method. Um, uh, for the operation co to continue. Uh, at the end of this, I've added, uh, this is not in the original presentation, but there's an 11 minute training video supplied by Chimera, uh, which we're grateful to. Uh, this is an actual video to Chimera and its uh, field personnel typo there in, in the proper way to set up a closed feed system. I think if, if, you have the time to take a look at it, it will give you a much better idea of, of really what goes into a closed feed system, that it's it's not just the pipe running to the application, but it's this uh, mother tote, uh, transfer tote ses system set up in a way that one vents to the other and there there's no open exposure to the atmosphere. So I think it's it's interesting and informative if you have, have time to see it.
Uh, again, potential for post-application exposure in the finished product. So uh, mentioned several times, biocides with the, the exception of uh, mold control and gypsum are not intended to remain in the final product and preserve the paper. Uh, in general, with the exception of the quads, all the biocides have low fiber subs substantivity. Uh, so the exposure level is really considered quite low. Uh, also, the high temperatures in the drier section will destroy all oxidizing biocides and many of the, the organic biocides and deactivate them. Uh, in food contact paper, it's required that uh, you have either FDA approval or a Health Canada letter of no objection uh, for those applications. So this section had a, a number of questions. Uh, uh, first here is, if there's no biocide when the product is ready for shipment, product meaning paper, how do we account for the byproducts of the biocide reaction and where do they go? Uh, and that goes on to say, I assume some of them are heat resistant. Uh, and is, does that mean there's no contribution from biocide from the effluent stream to the river? Well, this is, it's a difficult question to answer, but again, think back. The only exit points from the paper making system are the paper sheet, the steam, steam and air from the dryer section, and the effluent going to waste treatment. Again, there's no effluent that's directly discharged without waste treatment. So that's a, a concept that, that needs to be stressed. Uh, byproducts from the biocide reactions has to be in, in one of these streams. Now, the, the problem is I am not aware of specific data measuring biocide reaction products in paper. Um, that doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist, but I'm not, I'm not aware of that. But that type of analysis would be very difficult because, again, the biocides are added at low level. We, you know, we're generally at PPM levels. Uh, and finding then a mixture of degradants in a very complex analytical matrix uh, presents a real challenge in doing that type of measurement. Uh, that's really the best answer I can give for that. Uh, do paper mills have the capacity to measure air concentration of biocide degradants? I think I already answered this, that no, uh, paper mills just have rudim very rudimentary analytical labs. So now I'll finish up with a little bit on environmental fate and uh, paper mill residuals and waste. Uh, I've talked about broke a couple of times, but any waste paper is recycled is broke, brought back into the system. Fiber is expensive. So they try to capture as much as they can and reuse it. Uh, mills do generate a significant quantity of non-hazardous solid waste. And this can be from oil and, oil and grease, you know, scrap equipment, whatever. And you can see it's in the 0.1 to one kilogram per ton of paper produced. Uh, there are several mill, several organizations that are committed uh, to reduce this. Uh, Domtar, uh, which has mills both in the U.S. and Canada, has made a commitment that they will have uh, zero uh, uh, solid waste coming from their mills, and they have one mill in Canada that's already achieved that, that has uh, zero waste. Um, the mills produce almost no hazardous waste, and uh, any disposal of waste, be it hazardous or non-hazardous, is, is subject to uh, federal and local regulations. <clears throat> the paper mill effluent. Uh, so the paper mill effluent is made up of a number of different sources. So it's, it's going to be the uh, process water from both the pulp and paper mill. And for an integrated uh, paper mill, one with a pulp mill, the pulp mill contributes far more to the F effluent than the, the paper mill does. It's going to contain suspended solids, BOD, COD, and then other ingredients and whatever's in the paper making system can potentially be in the effluents. Again, we keep kind of stressing that is our belief that the biocides are generally consumed prior to discharge. And so, what leads us to this is let's take a, uh, a much broader view of in and out to the system. So we start with, with the influent coming in with uh, 
some biocide treatment. So fresh water gets you some in the paper mill, some in the steam plant, the boiler generates steam, uh, or, or say paper mill, pulp mill, paper mill. And we get wastewater from all of these. Um, a question was asked about what's the relative breakdown in an integrated mill, probably 70 to 80 percent of the water the effluent is coming from the pulp mill with the uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, coming from paper uh, effluent uh, with minor, very minor amounts coming from um, uh, cooling system. So we're trying to show with the yellow arrows where water recycle loops are and where biocides are. So the biocide can be degraded. We've mentioned the drier section a number of times by the high temperature, but there's also chemical interactions. I've mentioned earlier about low RP, uh, neutralizing most of the organic biocides and all of the oxidizers, uh, hydrolysis uh, and absorption onto other materials. So. Biocides in general are considered consumed in the paper making process with very little going to the. I shouldn't say very little, very little to none. Um, effluent regulations. Um, so the discharge from the wastewater systems are subject to uh, effluent regulations and I have a slide to talk a little bit more about in this. Um, so. In general, the treatment systems, mills, any integrated paper mill and all the large integrated non-paper mills have their own waste treatment systems. And these will be uh, controlled by permit. Uh, smaller mills will discharge to municipal uh, uh, waste treatment systems. These are generally small recycle or tissue mills located in an urban area. Uh, Mills are required to characterize and maintain records on their uh, discharges, and these, of course, are all under uh, federal action. Um, I think this is redundant to what I just said. So we'll talk, um, able to put together some data on MPDES permits. So the mills, uh, not discharging to municipal waste treatments are generally covered by uh, MPDES permit. And um, the graphs show the breakdown by permit type. And I again apologize, I'm not a regulatory expert, so I don't know some of the details. But in the permits requiring specific testing, uh, which is in 62% of the mills or so, the graph on the right shows the um, the items required in their MPDS, MPDS uh, permit to be tested. Uh, so you can see 92, 93% of the mills have to test for suspended solids and pH as you go down. And I put an arrow by toxicity because this is the probably the key measure that might get you to biocides. Because you'll see on this list, there are no mills that have a specific discharge permit requirement to measure biocide concentrations in the, the final effluent. But mills, uh, roughly half of the mills have a permit requirement for measuring the toxicity. And this can be on Daphnia or uh, usually always on Daphnia and then other species as well. And really can serve as a surrogate measure for uh, biocide presence. If there's a significant biocide, uh, uh, we would expect to see failures in the toxicity test and then troubleshooting to see where that's coming from. So that's the, uh, we're, we're coming to the conclusion here. That was the, the section on, uh, on effluent and, and discharge. And we did get a number of questions here that I'll go through. So is it, uh, is it common for paper mill effluents to be discharged from municipal waste treatment plants instead of surface waters? And I've already mentioned all the uh, integrated and non-integrated mills have waste treatment systems. Uh, a review of the Fisher database showed only 10% of the U.S. mills discharged to a municipal waste treatment system. Uh, are there data 
uh, to support the statements that biocides are consumed before being released. Uh, for our sides, uh, measurements root are routinely made of the effluent going to waste treatment plant uh, for residuals, and if any residuals are present, they are neutralized with, with the reducing agent. For organic biocides, uh, there is not uh, normally any measurement of uh, the biocide going into or out of the effluent. Uh, I just mentioned the toxicity testing acts as a surrogate, and there is no mill that is required by permit to, to measure. So uh, that's the, the state of that situation. Do we expect a biocide residual on food contact paper? Well, to obtain FDA approvals require uh, extraction studies to demonstrate the amount of residual of any in the sheet. Uh, the FDA then uses that risk ass assessment to set acceptable levels of uh, biocide uh, usage. Uh, the problem is that data is confidential to the party submitting the request to the to the FDA and is not available to the, the general public. Is there any data to show low exposure of biocide workers? Uh, any, again, this is a very difficult question. It's going to be entirely site specific. Uh, so the exposure is going to be different for each mill and the, uh, the biocide council, the CDC does not have any of this test, test data. So that's the summary of the, the, that's the presentation with the questions uh, we received during the initial presentation. So just to, to hit on the, the high general points, paper making is a complex process with a, many different sub processes. So you can't look at it as a single entity. Uh, the microbiological control programs are required for operational efficiency, final product quality and waste minimization. Uh, Microbiological programs are uh, integrated with multiple types of applications, preservation, planktonic control, biofilm control. So there are really three separate types of microbiological control applications. Um, biocide selection is complex. It's based on a number of factors, both the physical chemical uh, properties of the, the, the addition or where the products are being additioned, and then also uh, as demonstrated the, the complexity of developing biofilm control programs based on the flows in the mill. Uh, worker exposure is limited, and the, the biocides are really critical for the paper industry to, to produce in a profitable fashion. Um, before I finish up, I'll just mention a couple of references really good to have. Uh, the first is the Handbook of Pulp and Paper Technology by Gary Smook. Everyone in the industry just calls this the Smook book, and everyone has a copy. I know when I started in paper, I've had two copies because I was in the industry so long, but in, uh, in the Smook book, you'll, you'll, you'll find it's basically divided by uh, name. So if you look up Yule Box, it will give you a section on what a Yule box is, a picture of Yule box, how to use it. So it's a great reference guide for someone just coming into or not familiar with the paper industry. Uh, the second reference I'll, I'll recommend is the monograph on microbiology of paper making systems. This was published oh probably eight years ago uh, by TAPI, which is the Technical Association of the Pulp and Paper Industry. It was actually the, the microbio committee. Um, Microbiology Control Committee, and it's basically a book on uh, microbiology and microbiology control in the paper industry. It's uh, fair, fairly short, but again, it, those two are probably the, the best references to have sitting on your, your shelf somewhere. Uh, lastly, uh, you can go to YouTube. There are a whole number of videos if you look up paper making. So uh, the, uh, the, the team members put together uh, this list that we just found, and you can see the references are there. I highlighted four of them in bold. I thought were the better. I went back and, and looked at all of these again. Uh, but the uh, the one, the Cryptic Kids animation, if you want a little cartoon of uh, describing everything that I just went through on how to make paper, it, it's there. So um, I want to thank you for your time. That brings us to the end of it. Again, we've got an appendix with 20-something uh, pages on specific biocides. 
And if there are additional questions, uh, please direct them back and we'll be able to get you answers. Again, uh, thank you for your time. Bye.